Hello everyone, I am here with Paige Christman who is running to represent Oregon's 42nd district for their house, uh, mine actually. Unfortunately, she's not running in my district, but she is here to talk about her campaign because she is a democratic socialist and her campaign is absolutely phenomenal. So Paige, thank you so much for coming on the program. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, we're very excited about our race. We're running a 100% people-powered campaign with no cor corporate uh, money accepted. We're challenging a uh, centrist corporate Democrat who's funded by the fossil fuel industry, the landlord industry, Amazon. Um, and we're going to be in a really close race here to bring the progressive people-powered values that I know Oregonians share down to Salem with us. Yeah, I love that. And it's so exciting to see people in my home state step up and like run for Congress because... Oregon is a very, very deep blue state, so there's no reason why we have like this milk toast neoliberal democratic establishment type of people representing us. Like we need true progressives, democratic socialists such as yourself. And like I, I'm I'm just ready for change and to see everyone across the country in different states, you know, step up. It honestly makes me feel really happy. So tell us a little bit about yourself and your campaign. And if you could talk about the dynamic currently in this race, is this like a two way race? Are you the only progressive that's currently running? Um, give us a little bit of details on the situation. Yeah, sure. Um, so I currently serve as the electoral and legislative chair for the Portland Democratic Socialists of America, uh, which basically means I run our lobbying department. Um, but uh, we don't have any money, so we're not very good lobbyists. <laughs> but we try to uh, leverage our people power to influence uh, politics down in Salem. And uh, that that role that I served in this last session um, uh, had me down in Salem, our state capitol, working uh, at the legislature almost every day. And I became progressively more and more frustrated with our Democrat supermajority because we have a Democrat supermajority in both chambers of our legislature and a Democrat governor um, that constantly, time and time again, came up with compromises and half measures and sellouts to a, a Republican minority um, instead of fighting for the uh, interests of their working class constituents. Um, and that's really why I'm running. Now, uh, I also am a board member for Portland Tenants United, which is our largest tenants union here in the city of Portland. Um, I'm a disabled veteran. I was the first woman to serve as an indirect fire infantryman in the U.S. Army, which is a combat job that was previously open only to men. Um, until I was forced out of the military by the Trump administration's trans military ban. Uh, now I'm the first trans woman to run for the state legislature in Oregon's history. Um, and that's really important um, because there's over 7,300 state legislators in the country. Uh, and there's only four trans state legislators. So we are very voiceless in this country in our political system. And the consequences of that are very significant for trans people. Uh, for example, just here in Oregon, uh, which is a very blue state with a Democrat supermajority, trans and gay panic defense is still legal. And here in Oregon, trans women are housed in men's jails and prisons. Um, so there's a, a lot of um, uh, a lot of damage that our that our marginalization and our and our democracy has caused to the trans community. So it's really important that uh, we continue to fight for the representation that uh, trans Oregonians deserve. Now we are challenging an incumbent Democrat. Uh, his name is Rob Nose. He is. Um, uh, been in the state legislature since 2014, um, and he is the House Majority Whip, so he's the fourth-ranking Democrat in the House. And um, what really pushed me to run was that last session he voted to cut public employee pensions. Um, now, this is a Democrat supermajority voting to cut the pensions of teachers and nurses and firefighters, some of the most valuable civil servants in our state. I find that unacceptable. That's what Republicans typically do in other states, but who needs Republicans when you have Democrats like this? So we're going to make sure he doesn't get away with it. And we're going to make sure we replace him with someone who fights for the progressive values that I know our community shares. And this race really is important. Like, it's difficult for me to try to convince people in other states to care about, you know, internal Oregon politics. But this is really important. Like, what I want to point out is the impact that someone like, um, you know, Lee Carter has in Virginia being, you know, a Democratic Socialist elected. And with you taking out a leader in the Oregon Democratic Party and being one of just a handful of trans women elected. I mean, this would be huge. And you would be able to showcase why it's so important that we have democratic socialists in congress because your policies in comparison with average democrats i mean the difference is night and day um so i wanted to ask you about something that i heard from aoc as of late representative alexandria ocasio cortez who don't know she said something that really struck a chord with me because it's so true and she said it just beautifully basically um 
she says that we don't have a left party. The Democratic Party is not a left party. They are a center, center, right party. So I want you to kind of um, respond to that and also appeal to people in Oregon, because even though we're very blue, like I personally, and I, I'm sure it's the same for you, know a lot of people who are just very loyal to the Democratic Party. But explain to them why we need real representation for the left, um, especially in states like Oregon, where, I mean, theoretically, we should have so many different progressive policies passed with a supermajority. We're not getting that. So explain why it's so important that we make this distinction between Democrats and the progressive left and socialists. Absolutely. And I agree with AOC that the Democratic Party is not a progressive left party. It is a center or center right party. And here in Oregon, that's especially the case because we are so dominated by corporate money. So Oregon is one of the only five states that allows unlimited corporate campaign contributions. And as a result, we had the most corporate spending in our elections per capita of any state in the country. And that's going to Democrats. Um, there is no sitting state legislator that doesn't take corporate money in Oregon. And as a result, we see corporate policies getting uh, uh, shoved through the state legislature with ease. Um, meanwhile, teachers and nurses and firefighters have to go down and fight for their pensions for months just to lose. Um now, we saw, just as an example, um, Oregon Business and Industries is the largest lobbying group in the state. They were openly bragging um, last session that they were able to get a, a list of seven concessions into a student funding package um, that they negotiated openly with the House, uh, the House Speaker and the Senate President. Um, and this is being flaunted openly. So um, here in Oregon, the consequence of not having a true left flank party and, or, or not having a true left flank of the Democrat Party is that our party is dominated by corporations. Um, and I, I think that's unacceptable. I think that the only way to, to change that is to start electing people that don't take corporate money, to start electing people the right way by knocking every door, by building a movement and advocating for the policies uh, that working class Oregonians need to m improve the material lives that we live uh, and being unapologetically bold and progressive in doing so. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Yeah, and that's great. And I'm so glad that people like you, as well as like Amanda Seabee and Albert Lee, all from Oregon, you know, running for Congress or the House. Um, it's so important because I feel like with the Democratic Party, since they feel so safe in Oregon because it is a safe blue state, they kind of just can get away with not really representing their constituents. They can basically do uh, center right types of policies, uh, not really represent constituents and just feel safe because nobody's going to challenge them. But now, finally, we're all drawing a line in the sand and we're saying, this is not good enough, and it's time that you actually do the bidding of people, not your corporate donors. And it's so frustrating. So I wanted to ask you, so um, in terms of what could be accomplished, let's say you beat um, Rob. I think that this would be huge. Like, I think this would make national headlines because anytime a socialist takes out, you know, a, a member of leadership, it's just it's phenomenal and it scares the establishment. But I'm curious, what do you think you would be able to accomplish or what would you push for within that first year in office? Uh, I think we can accomplish quite a lot um, because it would be such a big, um, big victory for, for the left. It would have regional significance and it would be a national news story. And then we can leverage the people power that um, that win creates that moment in, in time where there's so much energy behind that um, to push our agenda moving forward in the legislature. Um, once, once we send that message that nobody is safe, that um, no Democrat is safe, no matter how much money you have, because our opponent has unlimited corporate money, he's raised $130,000 already for a state house race um which is like u.s house numbers and a lot yeah, of other that's states insane. <laughs> um that will send a message that nobody's safe and that um if you don't fight for the principles that your constituents hold dear then we're going to come for you and we're going to take your seat and we're going to replace you with someone who will um and that's the people power we're going to leverage once we're elected we're going to turn out people and and working with the coalition of of grassroots organizations that have endorsed us uh, we're going to turn out people to testify at hearings and uh, to protest at the Capitol and to go to town halls and other legislators' districts. And we're going to organize the constituents of other legislators to put pressure on them uh, to to stop this uh, this ever um, um, this ever increasing fall and in capitulation to the right. Because here in Oregon, the Republican Party should be insignificant, but they keep winning concessions from our Democrats, um, and that's unacceptable from a party that uh, has a super minority that that um, is irrelevant in our state politics. Yeah, you know the way that it should be in Oregon is that we should have like centrist Republicans more so than centrist Democrats, because if you can't really win 
um, then they should be the ones making concessions. But yet time and again, and this isn't just true for Oregon, it's true across the country in state legislatures. Um, we see Democrats making concessions and meeting Republicans halfway, which is just it's mind boggling to me. Um, this should not be the case. And I, I think that people across the country are so frustrated to where they are willing to, you know, shun the establishment and vote for someone who isn't necessarily an incumbent who they don't know. So I'm curious because you're working with a lot of progressive organizations. Um, what is based on like your your personal experience? What are some of the issues that voters are raising? Because I'm personally not familiar with this area. I, I'm not sure. Is this like around Boyd Center area? Um, it's just south of Lloyd Center. Oh, okay. Um, it, yeah, it's um, Kearns and inner northeast Portland, okay. and then most of inner southeast Portland. Oh, I see. So, I, I mean, I'm sure that the same issues, like, because I grew up around uh, in St. John's, and the same issues, I'm sure, plague that community, that area of Portland, like gentrification, income inequality, homelessness, and whatnot. So what are some of the concerns that constituents are telling you? Right. So housing, like you mentioned, is is really right at the top of the list. We have a huge housing crisis here in Oregon and houselessness is increasing. Um, and uh, it's been a, addressed by our centrist Democrats or attempted to be addressed by throwing more money um, into uh, developments and throwing more money into brand new housing and, and trying to um, open up the zoning to allow um, more dense housing. But that's been a uh, that's led to uh, an a surge in uh, high-rise luxury apartments and housing that may be dense, but still economically out of reach for most Oregonians. Um, so for example, I just moved because my rent is was too high. So I just moved three days ago and I moved into an apartment um, in inner Northeast Portland uh, that is a brand new construction luxury apartment building. And I'm the first tenant in my unit and it's a 300 square foot luxury studio apartment that costs $1,100 a month. Now, I don't want to live in a 300 square foot luxury studio apartment, but that is the cheapest housing that was available on the market in my district at the time that I moved. I had to stay in district, of course. So that's what I'm really angry about is that there's no real affordable housing in my district anymore. And this can be traced to the policies of the city and of the county and of the state um, that have treated this housing crisis um, not as a crisis of human rights, of housing being a human right that's not being met, but as an opportunity for developers and as an opportunity for the development and landlord and realtor lobby that all the state legislators take money from, including our opponent. Um, so we aim to address the housing crisis by uh, investing in dense, green, publicly owned and democratically controlled uh, public housing and guaranteeing housing as a human right, because there are 4,000 houseless people here in Multnomah County, and there are 16,000 vacant rental units. So this is not a supply issue. This is an inequality issue. Yeah, I totally agree. It, it, you know, it's devastating to drive through and you see so much homelessness. I mean, this has certainly been an issue for us in Portland, those of us who grew up here. But I mean, I, I, it's increased exponentially and it's it's just devastating. It's sad. And to see it not get addressed year after year when we have a Democratic supermajority, it's just it's unacceptable at this point. Um, so I wanted to shift gears a little bit. You are running as a Democratic Socialist, proudly so. You got the endorsement of the DSA in Portland. Um, so I don't think this is going to necessarily be an issue where we live in this in this state. But if you had to describe in your own terms to someone in Portland who's a little bit apprehensive about that socialist label, if they've been a lifelong Democrat or even a Republican, what would be the pitch that you make? Because this is something that I'm currently trying to wrestle with myself, uh, because I also identify as a Democratic Socialist. I'm a card carrying member to the national DSA. So, I mean, like, how do we win those people over who are so afraid about that socialist label in your view? Right. I think it just comes from having conversations about what we believe in, that uh, we believe in that every head should have a roof, that every child should have a teacher, that every family should have a doctor, um, and that every human being should be treated with dignity and respect and have value outside of their economic value under the capitalist mode of production and what they can produce. Um, and it's through that messaging, I think, instead of um, through uh, types of theory discussions about Marxism that we're going to reach the type of people who have this visceral reaction to labels like democratic socialism. Um, but also we shouldn't be apologetic because um, what we're advocating for is is bold transformative change and some people aren't going to um, uh, like that. It's going to make some people uncomfortable because of their privilege and because of um, their vested interest in the status quo. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that we don't always have to change their minds. Sometimes we just have to um, defeat 
the the people who are uh, uncomfortable with what we're offering. Because what we're offering is human dignity and a, a world that treats human beings uh, and places human beings above profit and places the planet above corporate profit. Um, and if, if that makes someone uncomfortable, then it's time for us to move on without them, I think. Yeah, yeah. And the reason why this question is so like important to me is because just like lately, someone in my family had like this visceral reaction to me um, because they saw an episode of the podcast and then asked me, Michael, are you a socialist? And I'm like, yeah. And the reaction was just like shock. And this person is not necessarily very politically savvy, doesn't really follow politics. Um, I won't say who it is in case they're watching. But like, you know, it just that made me thinking, like, how do we win these people over? Like, do I just focus on, you know, the policies and not that label? And really, I, I think it is important that we educate people because, like, I saw um, a, a tagline about socialism from Benjamin Dixon, shout out to him, where it's just sharing and caring. And it's funny because we learned that in, like, kindergarten, but yet we grew up in this ruthless capitalist system where people are sleeping on the streets, you know? So, um, yeah, I think that anyone in this district, if they know about you and they get out to vote, I think you win easily because the case that you are making is so simple that I don't know how you can go on with the status quo in Oregon with the way that it's going. I don't know how anyone is satisfied with the Democrats that we have in the Oregon uh, legislature. So I want you to make your case to voters. And also, if you can kind of speak to people who don't live in Oregon and think that, you know, Oregon internal politics aren't necessarily important to them. You know, can you talk about just why people in this district should vote for you and why nationally this really is important? Yeah, so this is a hugely critical race because of what's at stake. This is um, uh, a time right now here in 2020 when Oregon is building a new pipeline and a new fracked gas export terminal. We're expanding freeways outside of Portland here, uh, and we're moving forward with a neoliberal uh, mode of production that has brought us to the brink of a climate uh, crisis and on the brink of a climate apocalypse. And that's where we're at right now, and we only have a few years to fix this. Um, and and like I mentioned, there's over 7,000 state legislators in the U.S., and uh, most of them are funded by the fossil fuel industry and are funded by corporations that have a vested interest um, that is directly contradictory to working class people. Um, and it's up to us to fight back. And we have to do that not just by running for Congress and having uh, everyone who wants to be the next AOC run in impossible races against incumbents that they can't defeat, but also from the ground up, running for school board, running for city council, running for your state legislature, um, because every single arena that we're not fighting in, our landlords are, and our bosses are, and the fossil fuel industry is. Um, so we need to be fighting on all fronts. And right here in Oregon, this is an incredibly uh, winnable race. We're winning 65% of the voters that we talk to in our canvassing operation. Um, but uh, our opponent has near unlimited money. Um, so we've raised a little over $25,000. Our opponents raised $130,000. Um, so we're going to get outspent by a large, large margin. Um, so it would be greatly appreciated uh, if any of your uh, listeners could go to page2020.com and throw us a couple bucks because it'll go a long way. We're powered just by regular everyday working class people because that's who my only constituent is, is the working class people of this state. Yeah, and that's fantastic. We lost your image. It's just frozen, but we heard everything you had to say. So I will have all the information up on the screen. Paige, thank you so much for coming on the program. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, and for what it's worth, you have my endorsement, even though unfortunately I'm not living in the area where I can vote for you, but I'm going to be rooting for you, and I'm sure that my viewers are too. Thanks so much.